Okay. Um, thank you everybody uh, for joining us again for Frontiers in Child Health Research Seminar. Um, as you know, this is held on the second and fourth Mondays from September through June. Um, and our series includes speakers with work focused on child health from both UCSF as well as guest speakers. Uh, please let me know via email if you're interested in speaking or would like to suggest a speaker. Looking ahead, our next speaker on December 11th is Dr. Emin Maltepe from Neonatology. We're still virtual and using Zoom, and we'll ask you to stay muted unless you have a question, and we'll also open it up at the end uh, for questions. Today, we are welcoming Dr. Marissa raymond Flesh from the Division of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine and the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies. Marissa is an associate professor, a former Grumbach Award winner, right, Marissa? It's okay. been a while, but yes. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> I was like, I saw it and I was like, I, on your CV, and I was like, I'm pretty sure that was a Grumbach. <laughs> um, and a USA, USCSF John A. Watson faculty scholar. Uh, Marissa's research focuses on access to health care, mental health, and reproductive health care for adolescents and young adults in minority and rural communities. And she has a particular interest in community engaged participatory research. She also worked to evaluate increasing access to adolescent health services through technology by expanding telehealth and other online tools. Her work has been funded by the NIH, the CDC, and the UCSF Research Allocation Program. The title of Marissa's talk today is Eating Disorders and Psychedelic-Assisted Psychotherapy, Synergies, and Urgently Needed Investigation. Thanks for joining us, Marissa. Let me get my slides up first. All right, does that look okay to you guys? Good. Looks good. Okay, um, so our roadmap for today, let me just tell you with my Zoom a little to make sure I can see everything I need to. Our roadmap for, um, for today is to start a little bit talking about eating disorders, the current epidemiology, particularly related to what we've seen since the pandemic a bit about our standard treatments, uh, the neurobiology, especially of anorexia nervosa and the potential for psilocybin use to treat it. And um, then I will tell you about a clinical trial that we are working on called the study of psilocybin for anorexia in young adults. Um, and as Roberta alluded, I have this long track record of um, community-based participatory research. So it's a clinical trial with a particular flavor um, that involves a lot of stakeholder engagement, which I'll share with you all. So the first thing that I want everybody who leaves this talk to be very clear about is that eating disorders have increased substantially during the pandemic. At UCSF, we were starting to see an increase in our um, patients with eating disorders, even as early as 2017, 2016. You can see that they've really been going up over time. But when the pandemic hit, um, the rate increased even more rapidly. And at this point, we are our average daily census is hovering around eight or nine patients um, in the hospital at a time, when really 10 years ago, it was more like one to two, so it's a substantial increase. And at times, frankly, the number of patients we have in the hospital is um, mostly limited by the number of beds that we have available. There are many times in which um, our census would be even higher um, because there are so many ill children. Um, as I mentioned, eating disorders have worsened with the pandemic, and we're not. This is not just a UCSF phenomenon. Um, the overall incidence began increasing um, early in the pandemic. This is sort of a, a paper that really charted the data and how rapid the rise was um, nationwide. And um, we really saw in the pandemic that this was being driven by women and girls with anorexia nervosa. And these patients are young. Um, you can see a huge percentage of them are the 10 to 14 year old and 15 to 19 year old population. And they are more ill than many of the patients that we've seen in the past, both with psychiatric comorbidities and with medical complications of disease. Uh, one thing that this paper documented was an increased incidence of suicidal ideation and suicide attempts amongst these patients presenting for hospitalization. Um, this table has a lot going on, but I just want to highlight um, that while mental health concerns were increasing overall during the pandemic, um, eating disorder concerns far outpaced other diagnoses. So this is from a cross-sectional analysis of national commercial health insurance claims of youth mental health eating, um, emergency department visits from the uh, 
3 2019 so pre-pandemic through 2 22 um and it really shows um you know we've seen an increase in a lot of these diagnoses but eating disorders if you just zoom in on that have increased from pre-pandemic to pandemic year to 120 percent uh, there's been a lot of media about eating disorders there's been a lot of media about depression suicidal ideation um, and attempts and self-injury those things have increased 16 percent 44 percent eating disorders have increased 120 percent in terms of um, emergency department visits so what can we do right now for eating disorders um, in patients and families who are struggling with them our standard treatment is something called family-based treatment. Um, it's a form of psychotherapy that empowers families to work towards weight restoration. It's very agnostic about the underlying causes of eating disorders. It focuses much more on the medical urgency of weight restoration. Um, and it, it works for some people, um, but there's sustained remission in less than half of cases. And um, it puts an incredible demand on the families. Um, families have to spend a lot of time with their adolescent. They have to eat with them six times a day, supervise all meals and snacks, supervise them for a period afterwards to make sure that they don't purge. And this form of therapy is also not widely implemented outside of academic medical centers. And it is very hard to come by in languages other than English. So it leaves many people out. In terms of psychopharmacology, there's been no medications that have been proven to be effective for core symptoms of anorexia nervosa. Second generation antipsychotics um, have had some weak uh, efficacy with AN, and there's some evidence for fluoxetine for patients who have binge purge episodes in bulimia, and it's frequently used in patients who also binge purge with AN. The hard thing about all of this is that we don't have a lot of great treatments. Many of them are not available. And we do know that unless evidence-based treatment is provided within three years of symptom onset, our patients' prognoses are poor regardless of access to treatment. Unfortunately, we also know from our post-pandemic data that the age of onset of eating disorders, especially anorexia nervosa, seems to be falling and maybe as young as 12 years old now. So the core of this talk will really be um, this question of anorexia and psilocybin and um, the synergies between the two and how they might function. The neurobiology of anorexia, um, AN is a restrictive eating disorder. That means people um, restrict their calorie intake or have too low of a calorie intake for their amount of output. And um, we really think it's actually a, a means of reducing negative mood or anxiety that's caused by skewed interactions between the serotonin inhibitory systems and the dopamine reward system. FMRI suggests that there's a dysregulated pathway um, in awareness of homeostasis needs. And this really allows um, patients with anorexia nervosa to essentially use um, their executive control networks to depress their, their really central biological motivational drives for things like food. Um, and the malnutrition that results from anorexia nervosa leads to a loss of both gray and white matter um, on MRI. Gray matter loss is particularly pronounced in adolescents. Um, as much as 10 or 11 percent of gray matter is lost in adolescence. So um, again, this is a disease with very early onset. It's really critical to try and um, mitigate these risks early. So in terms of classical psychedelics and how they might function in the same pathways that underlie AN, um, classical psychedelics, this includes things like mescaline, LSD, psilocybin, DMT, um, are all, all function at the serotonin 2A receptor as partial agonists. Um, they increase occupancy, um, and with that increased occupancy, you have more and more of a subjective experience of um, the psychedelic, psychedelic experience clinically, um, which tells us that this dose-dependent relationship really tells us that um, these effects are related and um, it's this particular receptor where they seem to be functioning most. We also know, um, and are starting to learn about um, anti-inflammatory pathways and the neuroplasticity that results from classical psychedelics. I won't go into great detail here, but um, we actually do see growth and uh, dendritic 
uh, proliferation synaptogenesis in um, you know, petri dish models of classical psychedelics um, in, uh, in the lab. Um, so AN and psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, um, the hypothesized mechanisms are first, patients with AN have reduced 5H2TA um, binding in the frontal, parietal, and occipital cortices. And it's thought that this is what gives rise to the cognitive rigidity that these patients experience. Um, psilocin, which is the active metabolite from psilocybin, is an agonist, as I mentioned, at the 5-HT2A um, receptor, and it is well documented to enhance cognitive flexibility. Um, this has been shown particularly um, consistently in patients with depression, and it's something that we're interested in investigating in our trial with a couple of different measures. Then the other mechanism that we believe might be helpful is that patients with, with AN have disrupted connectivity between their executive uh, control network and their default mode network. So um, the executive control network, as you guys know, is kind of the higher level capacities. The default mode network is a network that's really responsible for self-referential thought. Um, you can imagine that um, in a patient with something like anorexia, it has to do with the ways that they think about their body, the ways that they perceive themselves. Um, and psilocybin decreases the activity and functional connectivity within the default mode network while expanding global functional connectivity. Um, and I can show you what that, uh, I'll show you a little bit, a schematic of what that looks like in a moment. And um, the last couple of mechanisms we think may be in play are that anorexia nervosa is hospitalized to be, is, excuse me, hypothesized to be a chronic inflammatory state. Um, and psilocin has been seen to be a potent anti-inflammatory in both animal and human studies. Um, it seems to work across a, a variety of inflammatory pathways um, that we are still very much trying to understand. And um, Anorexia also has deficits in neuroplasticity or the ability of the nervous system to functionally modify itself in response to an experience um, in both clinical studies and animal models of anorexia nervosa. And again, psilocin potently increases synaptogenesis and neurogenesis. Um, and one marker that we're going to be using for that is BDNF. So this is a schematic um, that is uh, just really shows the increase in functional connectivity and the decrease in segregation that we see when patients are on a classical psychedelic. Um, so uh, figure A here is normal connectivity. And you really see a lot of segregation that happens in the brain. These pathways are um, much more efficient um, and that's why our brains segregate in these ways. But on a classical psychedelic, we see a huge amount of connection across different parts of the brain. Um, and uh, this is hypothesized to be one of the ways that um, there's promotion of neurogenesis um, and increased neuroplasticity overall as a result of um, classical psychedelic exposure. So what do we know so far? There's been, uh, there are multiple clinical trials that are happening in older adult populations of people with anorexia nervosa. Only one has been published to date. Um, this was a small uh, preliminary study of 10 adult women um, with a mean body uh, mass index of around 19. They all had uh, anorexia nervosa, some were in partial remission and they received a single dose of a fairly standard size, 25 milligrams of synthetic psilocybin in conjunction with psychological support. And I'll go through a little bit more about what these clinical trials typically look like. Um, in terms of sort of the bottom line for these results, um, there was no, in terms of safety and tolerability, there was no clinically significant changes in electrocardiogram and vital signs in suicidal ideation. The most significant adverse event was that two patients developed asymptomatic hypoglycemia, which is something our team actually had been quite concerned about. Um, and then the other thing is that um, they, they were, this was really a trial to look at safety and tolerability. So, um, there's limited data in terms of outcomes related to AN itself. What they were able to report is that weight concerns decreased overall from baseline to three month follow up. Four participants um, demonstrated global um, EDE scores, which is sort of the standard measure um, and diagnostic interview for eating disorders um, with, within one standard 
uh, deviation of community norms. And that's considered um, essentially in remission, close to community average. Um, but the effects were highly variable in this really small um, sample, really a case series. So I'm just going to zoom out a little bit and um, share a metaphor that one of our colleagues here at UCSF created um, to help people think about how psychedelics work um, and also help contextualize what happens after psychedelic dosing. Um, this metaphor was created by Robin Carhart Harris, um, who's here at Neuroscape um, and has done quite a bit of work in um, classical psychedelics, including one of the large studies of psilocybin for depression. And he says that one can think of a classical psychedelic as um, shaking the snow globe. The snow in this metaphor is sort of the ruts that we get stuck in in our thinking, especially our patients who have severe and refractory mental illness. Um, the neurobiologic corollary might be the default mode network getting too rigid. And as I mentioned earlier, my patients might get stuck in thought ruts like I'm so fat, no one will ever love me, it's never going to get better. Um, and psilocybin shakes the snow globe and then the snow has time to settle. This is that period of neuroplasticity. And one of the things that researchers are starting to pay a little more attention to and that we're very interested in is what is the environment as the snow settles? How can we do the best that we can to make sure that people are getting the most benefit possible out of psychedelic dosing in a therapeutic environment? And for that reason, um, we're really paying attention to our therapeutic approach um, and the context of this trial design. So I want to emphasize here that this is not a trial of psilocybin to treat anorexia nervosa. It's really a trial of psychedelic assisted therapy or psilocybin assisted therapy to treat anorexia nervosa. Now, a typical psychedelic therapy trial design um, has, of course, intensive medical screening at the beginning. We're still um, really working towards a better understanding of who is safe to be dosed um, on different classical and um, other psychedelic medications. The most commonly used in clinical trials these days are MDMA, the street name is ecstasy, and um, psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in hallucinogenic mushrooms and what we'll be using for our study. So an extensive medical screening period. Um, then there's a phase of preparatory therapy, and this therapy is um, meant to help patients anticipate what's going to happen when they are using a psychedelic. Um, it's therapy that um, allows them to think about what their intention is for their psychedelic experience. What are they hoping to get out of it? What are they hoping will change in their lives and in their disease as a result of participation in the trial? There's a dosing day. And for psilocybin, um, it is active in a patient's body for at least six hours or so. So these dosing days are long, um, about eight hours from start to finish. And they also have uh, usually two licensed therapists present during the day, in part because the day is so long and the therapists themselves need breaks at times. And you cannot leave a patient who um, is on a, on a psychedelic alone. Um, but this is also in part for the patient's safety. They're in a very vulnerable state um, and it's become standard of care to always have at least two people present on dosing days for the patient's safety as well. After the dosing day um, are several integration therapy sessions. The purpose of these therapy sessions is to help uh, trial participants or patients make meaning of what they experienced on the dosing day Think about how it might impact or change um, their relationship to their illness, their behaviors, um, their interests um, and in life moving forward and the things that they want to change and continue to work on. Um, and this is really to set them up for that um, period of plasticity. We're still trying to get a sense of how long that might be, but some people hypothesize as many as long as um, months or even a year uh, post dose. This is the standard trial design, and then trials vary with how many dosing days they have. Uh, it's typically anywhere from one to three dosing days. Two important ideas related to psychedelic assisted therapy are set and setting. These are old concepts um, born out of the 70s and 60s, and the set is the lived experience of the participants um, and how it impacts their beliefs, their expectation, their mental health, and what they bring into the session. Then the setting is the environment in which the psychedelic is given, and there are, are huge uh, uh, trials and um, 
fields of study related to the setting in psychedelic assisted therapy. Entire dissertations written on just the music alone. Um, it really seems to impact significantly the participants um, experience. And again, we're still just beginning to learn exactly what that looks like. For the purposes of clinical trials and what we're doing here at UCSF, um, our dosing rooms are in the basement of Pritzker. Um, they are quiet. Um, they're meant to be sort of they have variable light, which is usually dimmed a bit for the participants' comfort during the psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, they have a comfortable couch for the participant to sit on blindfold if they are comfortable using that so they can stay really internally focused. Um, and then this also includes the um, therapists or facilitators and what they are bringing into the environment. Um, and um, as I mentioned, we will be having facilitate two facilitators um, facilitate our dosing sessions as well. In terms of the therapeutic intervention, um, it's quite different from any of the other therapies that are currently available for anorexia nervosa. Um, in uh, traditionally speaking, it's not very focused on changing the, in our case, eating disorder symptoms or the, um, the disease process itself. Um, the goals and intentions are really broadly defined and driven by the participant. They may be something more like wanting to feel connected to others or wanting to be able to be a more active participant in life. Um, other things that we're considering related to anorexia nervosa, we want to think about how to foster safety and openness in this population that we know is pretty predisposed to risk aversion. Um, and intolerance of uncertainty. Um, and so we're really thinking a lot about the preparatory settings, how to help people know what to expect. Um, and, and that's tricky. Every psychedelic experience is really different. Um, so preparing participants to be flexible, um, to accept what comes, and to trust the facilitators to support them through anything that happens. And then in the integration, um, after the psychedelic dosing, we're really thinking about how to facilitate longer term integration. And I will share a little bit more about that with you. So I know in this, um, in this talk so far, I've spoken really broadly about these huge increases that we've seen in patients with eating disorders. But I do want to take a moment as I shift to telling you exactly more about what we're doing in our clinical trial to tell you about um, how we came to do this work. And I'm going to briefly share with you one patient's story from one day during the pandemic when I was on service. Um, this was in 2022. I was the attending physician on service. We again had a large number of patients in the hospital, much larger than we had had um, just a few years earlier when I joined faculty. And um, I was taking care of a particularly ill patient who was hemodynamically unstable very much needed to eat um, and would rather die than eat. She was very clear with everyone on the team. And um, as a result, the only thing we could do to keep her alive was to continue giving her nutrition. Um, and our next step was to place a nasogastric tube for that nutrition with her parents' permission. And I remember being in her room with several of our excellent nurses supporting her during the placement of this NG tube. And she did something that um, luckily I've never had another patient do. Um, she, her anorexia was so strong and she so wanted to die that she managed to cough up that feeding tube and bite holes in it so I couldn't feed her. And it was a moment of real powerlessness for me as a physician. Um, I'm used to my patients coming into the hospital very sick, but I'm also used to knowing what to do for them and how to keep them safe. And um, in those moments of real powerlessness during my life, I kind of have a mantra I come back to. And that is, um, I ask myself, what power and privilege do I have? And am I using it to the best of my ability? And the idea that kept coming up over and over was the things that I had read about um, one of the large early trials using MDMA to treat PTSD. Around the time this happened with that patient, their one year follow up data had come out and it was pretty amazing. Um, in that trial, they saw about two thirds of the participants go into remission by the end of the study. And what blew me away was that a year later, more participants had gone into remission. We almost always see regression to the mean in behavioral health trials, right? More people don't keep getting better over time. And with data like that, I had to ask myself, what's possible in anorexia? Could one of these medications really make a difference for our patients? 
um, and in consulting with other team members, um, I was really excited to find that many people at UCSF were really interested in exploring that question with me. And that's how we came to this amazing team that we have now. Um, I'm partnered with Joshua Woolley, who runs a lab that's entirely focused on uh, psychedelic assisted therapy trials at this point um, within the Department of Psychiatry. Um, Amanda Downey and Sarah Buckley run our eating disorder program um, and we're very enthusiastic to do this work here. I think Sarah told me something like, of course, this has to happen at UCSF. Where else could it happen? And um, we have an amazing team of um, faculty members who are collaborating with us, um, who are psychologists in our eating disorder program, including Sarah Forsberg, Lisa Hale, Jess Kieser, um, and Lindsay Bruett. And then the last colleague on this list is Gisela fernandez Osterhold, who is the main psychedelic facilitator um, in Josh Woolley's lab. So as we began planning this study, we started zeroing in on some key elements that we wanted to investigate. We wanted to do a trial with 18 to 25 year olds because we know this is a critical window in terms of neural development. It's a period where there's still very active um, pruning happening in the neocortex. And so um, the, ability, the, the potential impact of a, a intervention at this stage seemed much higher, but it also seemed like an important time to figure out um, if this could be done safely, if you can safely give someone in this age range a psychedelic. We wanted to maintain family involvement. Family involvement is really core to most of the most successful therapies that we know of in eating disorder care, um, and family involvement is, is typical in our most successful um, treatments, even into young adulthood. We also know that anorexia nervosa is incredibly debilitating. A large percentage of young adults with AN aren't able to work and remain very dependent on family for um, their um, finances, but also for assistance with their care. At UCSF, equity is absolutely critical to us, and it's a value that I brought in from my other health disparities work. Um, so we wanted to do this from the get-go with Spanish language capacity. Um, and I, I remain surprised to tell you that this actually will be the first Spanish English um, psychedelic study that's been born and been done in the United States. Um, it amazes me that there haven't been more. And um, we really wanted to be thoughtful about that period where the snow is settling and think about our approaches to collaborating with community therapists, since we know that this will be a relatively brief and time limited um, intervention. So I'll present a little bit of data um, that we gathered from them. When we began, um, we took a look at the literature, at what's out there um, by different medication types um, and also by these criteria that we're really interested in investigating. And I put this slide up mostly to emphasize the white. Um, there was very little data out there, which is very exciting as a researcher. It means that there's a lot of room for us to contribute. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about a preliminary study that we did um, to give some thought to where our patients will go after this brief study and how it's helped to shape the design of our trial. We reached out to um, therapists and physicians across the state of California who self-identify as um, primarily taking care of patients with eating disorders. And we asked them to share their thoughts about how they wanted collaboration and education about psychedelic assisted therapy trials. Um, and they highlighted several domains where they wanted support. Um, prior to psychedelic therapy, they wanted um, information and education from research centers about who would be appropriate to refer, some basic information about protocols so they can tell their patients a little bit about what to anticipate. If their patients enroll in a trial during the psychedelic assisted therapy phase, they want to be able to provide collateral information um, and get updates from the psychedelic therapy team and they requested some sort of documentation at the end. Um, we zeroed in over the course of the focus groups on the idea of a written summary prepared by the client or the research participant to take back to their outside therapist so that they could set goals and think about what they wanted to share with their therapist moving forward. And then after a patient exits a psychedelic assisted therapy trial, the therapist um, wanted to be able to continue to consult intermittently um, in case they encountered anything they thought was an adverse event or they needed additional strategies and guidance about how to support patients as they continue the integration process. Um, some requested uh, and liked the idea of trying to 
um, to ask research centers to move towards formal consult consultation groups for these therapists in the community, um, or having a follow-up group for clients. And those are all things that our research team is interested in in the long term. And then they really wanted some guidance about resources. There's a lot of information on the internet about psychedelics, and they asked for a curated list of scholarly publications about psychedelic assisted therapy trials. Um, they asked for reputable links to talks, workshops, podcasts, or CE programming. Um, and they asked for high quality psychedelic um, assisted therapy trial uh, training programs. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and these are all things that we are beginning to think about within the Spagna context. Um, this was a qualitative study, um, and I'm only going to share one quote from the trial, um, and that's, I feel like it really summarizes a lot of the things we're going for um, and that we were learning about in this focus group study. One of the therapists said, I will be part of the team, whether I'm on the faculty or not. In my viewpoint, I need to be on the front end and on the back end of the study. So what we're taking from this for Spagna is um, we're going to be incorporating a participant created summary document um, that's that our participants are going to do during their integration therapy that they are going to be able to share with their family members if they want to, and also um, to take back to their therapists or medical providers. Our um, therapists, especially the therapists focused on eating disorders, um, will offer to do a verbal handoff with any outpatient therapists if the research participant wants us to. Um, and our team is creating a list of publications and resources for referring providers and we're beginning to develop some formal CE programs we actually um, put in an application to do a workshop at the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine this year for the first time. And then I'll say a little bit about other community engagement that we're doing that's also shaping the study. Um, we have an advisory board that we're putting together. Um, it has sort of two big populations. Um, the first is people with lived experience with anorexia nervosa, um, and we're looking for people who are not eligible for the study, um, either because they are very far in recovery or because they're a bit too old for it. Um, and this is to avoid disclosure of some of the blinded study elements, but also to avoid dual roles with the research team. And um, we don't want people to think that, you know, because they're on the advisory board, they will definitely get a spot in the study. We, of course, can't guarantee that. And then we are also putting together um, a group of family members who have lived experience supporting a young person with AN. Again, trying to recruit people who um, wouldn't have a child that wanted to enroll in the study right now. So far, we've recruited six young adults and two parents, um, and we've planned for quarterly meetings to share results and seek advice on the study. Um, some examples of topics that we already know we want to talk with them about are education about the study design and the research process and timeline. We want to get feedback about certain aspects of study design. For example, we know that we want our patients to eat during the trial, during the dosing day, to make sure that they don't become hypoglycemic. And we want to think about how to do that in the most collaborative way possible. And then um, we also want to talk with these uh, advisory boards about participant feedback that we get from planned exit interviews. We're going to be doing exit interviews with all of the young adults and their parents um, at the conclusion of the study to understand how the study impacted them and their illness, what was most helpful, and what we can improve. So all of this helped to inform the trial design that we're working with. Um, our primary objective in Spagna is to assess the 28 day treatment efficacy of psilocybin on anorexia nervosa symptoms using the EDE, the eating disorder examination, um, which is a, a very highly validated standardized um, interview about eating disorder symptoms. Our secondary objectives are to assess the safety of psilocybin. Um, we'll be looking at vital signs, electrolytes and echo uh, electrocardiograms on dosing day. Um, we're going to be assessing the effect of psilocybin on rigid thought patterns um, with sort of a, a tablet based um, test. Um, we're going to assess three month and 12 month efficacy outcomes, um, including um, the EDE, as well as um, any changes to percent VMI, vital signs, and anorexia nervosa symptoms. And then assessing the impact of psilocybin on really common comorbid conditions such as anxiety, depression, and OCD. I'm not going to go through our full um, inclusion and exclusion criteria today, but briefly, we're going to be enrolling people 18 to 25 years old who have um, 
uh, DSM-5 confirmed anorexia nervosa, and there are actually several subtypes of anorexia. There's a restrictive subtype, a binge purge subtype, and then something called atypical AN, where patients um, engage in all of the same behaviors but don't end up as low of a weight. And then um, we really want people to have failed at least one treatment before we jump in. And we're looking for patients with BMIs as low as 12. Um, we do um, primarily want our patients to be able to speak English um, just to make sure that we can work with most of our, um, our facilitators and uh, psychotherapists, uh, though we may uh, change this over the course of the study. Most of our patients at UCSF do speak English, the young adults themselves. And um, we need people who are willing to um, so, uh, abstain from substance use for 48 hours pre and post dosing and use a highly effective form of contraception. The exclusion criteria are many, but um, if they're pregnant or breastfeeding, if they're medically unstable um, from their eating disorder, if they have prolonged QTCs um, or any other EKG abnormality or known heart disease, they have a personal history of seizure disorder, bipolar disorder, um, chronic site. Uh, psychotic disorder or severe substance use disorder, those would be contraindications. And then one of the most difficult is that patients cannot be on SSRIs, SNRIs, antipsychotics, or several other serotonergic types of medicines. The family members will also be enrolled as participants in this trial. Um, they have to be over 18 years old, um, engaged in supporting the young adult participants anorexia ner uh, nervosa treatment since diagnosis or for at least one year. Um, they can be bilingual, um, and this is the main bilingual piece of the study that we're starting with. Um, and then they must be willing and able um, to pick the participant up and stay with them uh, overnight on the dosing days. They cannot participate if they themselves have an active eating disorder. Um, if they have other mental health conditions that might make it hard for them to engage with the treatment team, and if there's a history of significant abuse between the young adult participant and the family caregiver. Respania will be doing two doses um, with this piece of family engagement, which is also fairly novel in the world of psychedelic assisted therapy trials. Um, we're going to have families come in at the very beginning um, for both some uh, fam family only and some young adult and family um, therapy sessions during the preparatory period. This is to pro provide the family with some education, make sure they know what to expect, allay any fears they have, um, and also to um, to to help them get ready for change. Um, in some cases, patients who undergo psychedelic assisted therapy have pretty profound changes in their symptoms and behavior. And I think we all know from caring for children with chronic disease, families really get organized around chronic illness. And um, it can be a very abrupt change um, to have that go away, especially for a behavioral health condition. So we want to prepare the family for change um, and help them think about how to support the young person during the course of the trial and afterwards. Um, and we're getting there. Um, this is happening. Our IRB application has been approved. Um, we're currently awaiting FDA approval, hiring our CRCs, building our database, um, and we anticipate um, enrollment this coming spring. And, you know, I think in the longer term, this will be the first trial. We're hoping for a trial, excuse me, of about um, somewhere between 20 and 40 participants. Um, we are fundraising with philanthropic dollars um, to try and do the large trial we can afford. Um, we definitely will dose at least 20 people. Um, and our goal over time is to scale up to a larger trial. Think about how to tailor um, this therapy to different uh, subtypes of anorexia nervosa, um, especially thinking about what medical monitoring might be needed for patients who are severely underweight versus patients who were binge and purge, things like that. We wanna think about how to refine our engagement with families, um, would there be a role for support groups, for example, and how to refine our engagement with community therapists. And then in the longer term, um, I am an adolescent medicine doctor, and as I told you, um, the average age of onset of anorexia may be as young as 12 years old now. I shared with you that there's a three-year window for optimal treatment of anorexia um, before we know that patients um, can really end up on a uh, a uh, course for chronic debilitating illness or um, up to 10% of them die from this illness. And so I think um, 
treatment at age 18 might be too late for this part is, for this population. And I do think that um, it's important to consider whether older adolescents might someday benefit from this treatment as well. I also think it's important to remember that um, families and teens are starting to source these medications um, in extra legal channels. Families are taking teens to other countries to get dosed. Um, they are taking them to Oakland to get dosed. Um, these medications are available in less monitored settings. And so I do think there is a moral imperative to do this research um, and figure out how we can dose patients safely and which patients can be safely dosed. So um, if our young adult studies are safe and effective, we have a long-term interest in testing the safety and efficacy in older teens with severe and refractory AN. And I will end with this kind of statistic um, that I'm sure is familiar to many of you as pediatricians. On average, it takes nine additional years for a novel drug to be approved in the pediatric population after adult approval. I will add to this statistic that in the United States, a patient dies of an eating disorder every 52 minutes, every 52 minutes. So every one of these years is a year that we would lose patients, and we really want to be prepared to study these medications in younger populations as soon as it seems safe and reasonable to do so. And with that, I will stop my screen share so that we can talk. Uh, um, I see in the chat one person asked the question, is there any role for THC or marijuana in anorexia uh, nervosa treatment? Um, there certainly have been people who have considered that. I think one of the important things to know about anorexia is that it is not a disease of lack of hunger. Um, this like executive control network function and its ability to sort of override these basic hedonic drives um, means that it's not that our patients aren't hungry, it's that they um, override their hunger cues. Thank you, Nikki. Any other questions? I tried to go fast in case there was a lot of questions. I will share with you guys, I've told Dr. Hirsch this, I was once DARE student of the year a few decades ago. I never thought my career was going here, um, but I think we, we all have to follow the science um, that might help our patients. <laughs> A great presentation. Um, if there isn't someone ahead of me, I can't see. Um, I just wanted to note that this work is super challenging. I love that you brought the youth in and in, in terms of their voice. And um, do you have a sense of how you think that might change the therapeutic delivery? Like, do you have any guess, guesses based on what you already know? I mean, you alluded to yeah. it a little bit, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I think a lot of the things that I know for sure that I want to ask the um, our, our advisors about um, are some of the stickiest spots. Um, I think I mentioned, you know, we actually, even before the first paper came out, we were really concerned about the possibility of hypoglycemia. In traditional dosing sessions, people usually fast beforehand and all day while they're on these medicines in traditional settings. Um, and our patients simply do not have glycogen stores in their liver. I was worried about people having seizures by the end of that. And so we had actually already written into our protocol a, a couple of different options for them to eat. We wanted them to take in um, something with some protein and fats in it. Um, so we kind of sketched out a couple of different options with various like protein bars and Gatorade or just drinking like whole milk, things like that, um, that we're going to provide for them. But I think it may be a deal breaker for some people. I think it may be so anxiety provoking that some patients can't do it. Um, and that's one of the pieces that I know for sure we're going to ask our advisory board about like how to present that, um, how to talk about it early, how to make sure it's, it's like literally in our consent form um, because um, we want to be very upfront but also collaborative, like share with people like this is really for your safety. Um, and now I feel even more um, urgently that we have to do it since that's like the one adverse event that we've really seen from these trials so far. Yeah, good for you. Well, it's great. You're lifting up their voices. It's awesome. Larissa, that was great. It, um, if I think uh, it looks like Roberta had a drop off. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So if there aren't any more questions, I think we'll, we'll sign good. off. But I want to thank you again for such a great presentation and for the great work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you guys for taking the time to listen. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.